So, amateur astronomy. Uh, first, let me introduce a little bit myself from this point of view, from a uh, point of view of uh, astronomy. Uh, I've been, uh, I'll just say that I've been in this company since 2005. Uh, after many transformations, I'm still here. I actually took one uh, year of a break uh, in 2008 uh, to go home to Macedonia. And uh, right now I'm basically working in global project management and that's the only business thing that I will say. When it comes down to astronomy, I've been a huge fan since the earliest of times, really. I remember when I was four, I asked my grandfather, what are those areas on the moon that's a little bit uh, green? He told me those are oceans. <laughs> so uh, not the best advice, but I still remember it was a nice conversation with my grandfather back when I was a kid. So I started reading a lot of magazines about astronomy. I didn't have any optics at that time. Uh, then back in uh, 98, I was lucky to take some part in some boot camps of astronomy organized by uh, our education uh, uh, de uh, department in Macedonia and uh, managed to win uh, first place in astronomy uh, on the state level, uh, Macedonian one in 98. 98 by photographing the moon with some binoculars and 99 also had the chance to experience the almost full eclipse of the sun in Macedonia. Here you see my brother and myself in um, classic 90s clothes uh, uh, photographing the eclipse at that time from a village uh, uh, nearby. Uh, here you can actually see the photo. Again, it was hugely improvised. Uh, we took a floppy disk, uh, basically the thing that you find inside, uh, put it in uh, front of the binoculars and took a photo. This proved as an uh, improvised home filter. These days you can often see me at the Planetarium Brno. I highly recommend it. Uh, you can experience a lot about space and astronomy there, especially if you don't have a telescope and you're interested in seeing some real stuff. They organize uh, usually when the weather is nice during the night, like for, I don't know, 50, 100 crowns, some over observations with uh, real uh, telescopes. So highly recommended that uh, you can visit it. Now to move on to the topic, let's first clear out the difference between astrology or astronomy. Uh, if you want to make friends with an astronomer, tell them you like astrology. I'm sure it will trigger a very interesting uh, discussion. So what is this about? Astrology, it uh, was actually born around the same time as astronomy back uh, in the times of Babylon. So what they figured out was uh, the sun uh, is during the certain time of a year, it is in front of certain constellations. And they took 12 of those constellations and they created the signs of the zodiac. So Scorpius, Ares, uh, Aquarius, and all of that. And the theory was that when the time you are born, there is some energy shining from that constellation through the sun and it affects your entire personality. So far so good, but in 2600 years, the sky has shifted because of something called the precession, because the Earth is actually wobbling every 25,000 years. And long story short, uh, whatever sign you think you are, you're not really that sign. So, for example, they tell me I'm a Sagittarius, but if I look at the sun where it was when I was born, it's actually in the middle of Scorpius. So. The lesson here is update your systems, yeah? Astrology may be an interesting thought, but it hasn't been updated in 2,600 years and <laughs> it's causing some irregularities. Anyway, that, that that's about it. Uh, astrology is more like uh, a fun thing. It's more like a fantasy tale. But when it comes down to astronomy, it's actual science. Uh, we use actual uh, instruments to measure everything and it's tied to the laws of physics. So there's a whole branch called astrophysics, quite uh, fascinating, and we tend to focus only on what can be directly measured and imaged. What you see here is the most powerful telescope uh, ever designed, it's the James Webb Telescope. Actually, there are more powerful telescopes here on Earth, but because of the atmosphere, they do not have that capability as the one that is in space, which is not limited by uh, anything. A little bit of history, I mean, um, the, we don't have to go into too much detail, just to mention that it's a very old science. 
Uh, first it came about in Babylon. Uh, they were using the stars to predict uh, things that, were, that would happen in the different um, uh, seasons and stuff like that, like when to do the crops and things like that. Uh, Pythagoras was actually the first one to propose that Earth was a sphere and rotated around the Sun. Uh, in the Middle Ages, a lot of progress uh, was made, of course, with many f uh, famous uh, astronomers. Uh, my favorite contributor to astronomy in that time was uh, actually uh, Sir Isaac Newton, because he invented the most popular and most used telescope that we will discuss later. It's called a reflecting telescope. It's 500, maybe 600 years old, and it's still a very, very nice instrument. It's actually also called a Newtonian telescope, so quite interesting. And the modern age I already mentioned, uh, these days uh, to make any groundbreaking discoveries, we mostly use satellites like the James Webb, and this is, I think, maybe Hubble actually on the photo. Now, another distinction to be made, um, of course, when it comes down to astronomy, there are many sub-genres or sub-fields. And the first that one that uh, you will experience is there is a big difference between astrophotography and visual. Especially these days, the cameras can capture a whole lot more light and are much more sensitive than our eyes. So if you took a photo of uh, Andromeda, this is the closest galaxy that we have. This is how it will look like in the photo. But of course, if you take a telescope and look into it directly with your own eyes under a good sky, then you will see something like this. So it is very important to get your expectations right uh, when you're interested in looking at uh, different uh, stuff on the sky uh, through a real telescope that uh, you shouldn't be expecting something like this, but more uh, like this. And if we have another example here, uh, again, one of the most interesting objects in the sky, uh, it's called the Veil Nebula. It's looking like this. If you photograph it, uh, even from uh, amateur equipment, you can manage to get a photo like this. And if you look at it with your own eyes, you will see something like this. I mean, just the fact that you're able to see it at all, I think it's pretty fascinating. And if you want to take a photo like this, it's not that simple as well. There's a whole process involved. Usually it involves taking like 1000 uh, long exposure photographs, like uh, 30 seconds each. And then you use various software to combine them and figure out what are the colors here. And there was a question before everybody joined if these are fake colors. It's tough to answer. I mean, uh, as you can see with your own eyes, you will never be able to see colors, but it doesn't mean they're not there. Uh, the colors are actually emissions in certain wavelengths, which are very, very, very faint. But of course, if you have uh, a camera which takes 1000 uh, images and then you amplify it a lot, then uh, you will be seeing uh, this kind of uh, color. Uh, as we were saying, it's not random. If 10 people take the same uh, process and to do the same imaging, they will arrive at the same uh, result. And so these days, astrophotography is very, very uh, popular hobby as well. Uh, the disadvantage here is that it takes a lot of money. You will need to invest at least $5,000 to be able to do something like this. But the fact is, many people do it online. A uh, very uh, famous uh, source is Astrobin. You can just Google it. And there you will find thousands and thousands of uh, pictures uh, created by uh, amateur astronomers. So these four, for example, that you see, these have all been done by people with nothing more than just their telescope, laptop, and some uh, dedicated uh, camera. I am personally not that interested in astrophotography because A, it's expensive, takes a lot of time. And on the other hand, I personally do not see the need to create the 10,000 picture of the horse cat nebula. I, I can just go online and enjoy the view from somebody else. What I'm really actually interested in is visual astronomy. This means that you are actually looking at the real light which has traveled millions and millions of years just to hit your eyes finally and you enjoy something which is alive, which is real light. Uh, no computers around it, no LCD screens. So there is a whole other component, almost like a meditative uh, component to it. So what do we actually observe in the sky, uh, like amateur astronomers, if you get small telescope, what can you actually see? 
Well, I'd say there are three main categories of stuff that you can uh, observe, and they range from the easiest to the hardest. <laughs> First, uh, the most obvious ones, of course, you can look at the sun with a nice filter, and you can also look at the moon. So these are one of the most observed objects that you can actually see also with your naked eye, but even if you take a very small telescope or binoculars, you can uh, improve your experience quite a bit. Uh, then, of course, is the planets of the solar system. We have nine planets, but uh, in reality, visually, basically, we'll look at just two of them. <laughs> it's either Jupiter or Saturn. Mars, for the most of a two-year period, is too small to see anything. It's just a big, uh, shiny, small, uh, red little disk. And Venus, again, it's quite huge, but because there are so many clouds on the surface, usually you just see one huge uh, shining light and uh, no details can be seen, so it's not that enjoyable. So the vast majority of astronomers, they just observe Jupiter with its moons and Saturn. It may seem like boring, but not really. As we'll see later, they change a lot. They are always something, uh, there is always something new to look at there and it's quite enjoyable. And the last area, it's actually deep space. Uh, this uh, means anything outside of the solar system. And there are literally thousands and thousands of objects that uh, you can see. It's a little bit difficult to find those objects and to actually see them. You need a little bit uh, bigger telescope. We will discuss uh, later which kind and uh, which are used the most. But it's very, very rewarding when you're finally seeing an entire galaxy with your own eyes. So let's start with the sun. What you're seeing here is the sun in different with different filters and these are photos uh, from the dynamic solar observatory from nasa it's a satellite which is used only to observe the sun as amateur astronomer you could also observe uh, uh, the sun in these areas like um, filaments and uh, and all of that but uh, again, it's quite expensive. You need a very expensive filter in order to do that um, and mount it on a nice uh, telescope. So I would say you would need to invest something like $2,000, maybe $3,000 to observe something like this with your own eyes uh, with an amateur equipment. But uh, there is also good news. For about $50, uh, you can get a white light uh, filter. And in many ways, that's the most realistic uh, view of the sun because uh, it's just blocking uh, all the light. It's not just focusing on a very tiny spectrum where you can see just the filaments. And uh, it can show you the so-called sunspots and it can also show you granulation uh, of the sun. So as a comparison, uh, this was on uh, 29th of August. Uh, you can see the photos from directly taken from NASA's uh, satellite. And here we can see this sunspot, a uh, quite big one. Uh, these are usually, this area that you're seeing here is several times uh, the size of our entire planet. So quite uh, huge ones. And you can see the sun is quite huge. And at the same time here, you see a simple uh, photo that I had taken only using my cell phone. So it's basically the same, yeah. It's quite enjoyable and quite interesting that with very modest equipment, uh, just by using my cell phone, I was able to create uh, the same uh, photograph uh, that uh, came directly from uh, NASA. And if you take it a little bit to the next level, uh, after a couple of weeks, couple of months, I invested in a dedicated solar um, astro camera. Uh, and I also learned a little bit more about the image processing afterwards. I was able to create uh, quite nice uh, photos uh, of um, the sunspots. What you see here is a huge uh, sunspot. Again, it's several times uh, the size of the Earth. It's uh, caused by uh, areas of the sun. This what you see here is a little bit colder, like 4,200 oh, cool. degrees compared to 6,000 uh, degrees um, uh, in the surrounding area and uh, this caused this difference uh, in light that is uh, able to be seen and this caused so-called uh, dark uh, sunspots either way even inside here it's very 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 hot 
And uh, other thing that you see is our so-called solar granules. Uh, these are like convection currents of plasma, and each of these small dots um, has a size of about 1,500 kilometers. And uh, the good news about this, uh, the sun in white light, is that uh, these kind of things change very often. So every two or three days, a sunspot will appear and disappear. So you can easily spend half a year just playing around with photographing uh, the sun. And what I normally do is I just go to the NASA website, have a look at the sun in white light from their um, satellite, see if there is anything interesting going on. And if there is anything interesting going on, I can just spend half an hour imaging it or even looking directly through it uh, through an eyepiece. When I took this photo, it just took me like half an hour to get some video footage. My daughter was with me waiting to go to the zoo, so it was not even that uh, uh, that precise. So with some uh, more focus and attention, you can actually do even better pictures than this with nothing but uh, this modest uh, amateur equipment. Again, we'll discuss the details later. Now, of course, the big question always is, but what can I actually see? Like uh, so far, I've shown some photographs, some images uh, taken with dedicated equipment. But what are you actually going to see when looking through the eyepiece? And that's always difficult to find online. Uh, you will see a lot of nice photos, <laughs> but very difficult to find a representation of what you actually see when you look uh, here through this eyepiece. And let me show you <clears throat> a video that was captured. What we normally do is uh, we capture a video, and video is nothing else but a series of many, many, many uh, uh, pictures. And uh, the images that you saw on the previous slide, they were actually taken from this uh, video that uh, I had captured. This is a video of the sun that, as you would see it uh, looking through the eyepiece with your own eyes. As you will see, the biggest first difference is that it's actually white. And that's because the natural um, color of the sun is white. It's just light in all the wavelengths. And the only reason we see an orange uh, sun during sunset is because it's setting and the atmosphere is absorbing most of the um, blue uh, wavelengths and then you're seeing just the uh, orange and uh, yellow. And here you can see some hint of granulation, yeah, this uh, here. And already now you see we're looking at the big uh, sunspot that I had captured uh, earlier. Uh, you may be asking why it's moving. Uh, that's also another interesting thing that you experience when looking through a telescope. What you're witnessing here is the rotation of the planet itself. <laughs> so when Earth is rotating, of course, uh, things in the sky, they are moving relatively. And if you increase it uh, a lot, like this is like 200 magnification, then you actually see how the sun uh, is moving, relatively speaking. And then to capture a close up of the sunspot, we increase the magnification to 400. And here it's basically the limit of what the telescope can deliver. This is uh, now at the limit of what the telescope is doing. And here now you see the movement is even higher. What I'm doing right now is manually repositioning it so it stays in the shot. Yeah, and at 400, it's moving quite fast now because the planet itself is uh, rotating. And what we do after this is uh, uh, basically, uh, we just take all these pictures. Uh, there are software that uh, takes only the best pictures of it. And uh, let's say from these 10,000 uh, captures of frames, uh, you take the 1,000 best ones. You combine them, you image process them, color them a little bit uh, into orange. So then it looks more appealing and more interesting. And uh, then you arrive at the final uh, photograph. So that's uh, what we can do with the sun, with some nice uh, budget-friendly equipment, like the filter itself cost $50, so not exactly uh, bank-breaking. And again, if you want to do even more, then of course investment is much bigger when it comes to the sun.